Hi, this is James Barris. I hope you find this talk supports you in your practice. If you'd like to support my teaching, you can use the donate button underneath my picture on Dharma Seed to do that. Your support is greatly appreciated. In case you're wondering what the heck I was talking about, uh, the, the boy who, who knew Polly. <laughs> Did you wonder what, what am I talking about? There, uh, I, he's now in his 30s. He's about 35, 36. I met him when he was 12. And um, when he was, he, he's from Sri Lanka. And when he was, I think about three, he um, started spontaneously chanting in Pali. It never was taught any of this. Um, started chanting the Pali chants uh, that um, a lot of the that the the monastics, the monks, weren't didn't know quite how the chanting really was supposed to be. And they would list, they came, the great ones, Mahasi Sayadaw came to visit him, and all the, the, the great, or many of the great Sayadaws came to hear him because he knew them. He remembered, he was, uh, one of his lifetimes, one of his incarnations was uh, with um, Ajahn Buddha Gosa, who is the, the great, um, who wrote the great commentaries on the Pali Canon called the Path of Purification, uh, the Vasudhi Maga, in uh, about 500 A.D. And this young boy, Dharma Ruan, remembered his lifetime there and uh, knew these chants. So you never know. There's a lot more than meets the eye. Just thought I'd share that in case you thought I was kind of strange there. Uh-huh. You still think I'm strange, right? Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, for those who haven't been here, been going through this series uh, using, this is an old edition, um, a book that used to be called Living Buddhist Masters. It's now out as Living Dharma that Jack Cornfield put together. A really excellent book of 12 different Theravadan masters from Burma and Thailand, <clears throat> um, and each one sharing their particular appro- approach to practice and their um, practice techniques. <clears throat> and so far, we've gone through <clears throat> or discussed Ajahn Cha, who is Jack's teacher, Mahasi Sayadaw, <clears throat> the great Burmese teacher. Last time we did um, Sunlin practice. Remember Sunlin Sayadaw? Where you kind of uh, go into an altered state of consciousness uh, and are very present for the sensations. The kind of almost military-like pushing through pain. We only got to, we did five minutes of it so we didn't get to the pain part. We just got to the pleasure. Um, but if you want to, you're welcome to do it on your own or go to a Sunlin monastery. And there are many in uh, um, Burma. Sayadaw, Burma, Ajahn, Thai. That's the usual distinction. And tonight, as I said, we're going to be looking at uh, Ajahn Buddha Das's approach to practice. Very different from Sunlin Sayadaw probably couldn't be more different. He's uh, more in the lines, uh, along the lines of Ajahn Chah, who we first started with. I'll tell you a little bit about his, about who he was, his bio. Um, he was born 1906, died 1993, uh, became a monk at the age of 20, um, and he... Um, he went down to, uh, to Bangkok to study, as young monks were expected to at the time, and he found that the, the temples there, as it says here, were dirty, crowded, and most troubling, corrupt. And as a result, he returned home and moved into an abandoned temple and continued practicing there. He was a scholar, but even more than a scholar, he was um, a practitioner 
who went beyond the orthodoxy to get to the heart of what the Buddha taught. And he was a radical and, in fact, um, came under lots of criticism. He had a lot of courage. Uh, he was the fellow, by the way, we've talked about before, in the 60s, I think it was, when the Thai government and country was moving more and more towards consumerism, Western uh, ways, where the one, uh, one of the, the power center of the Thai uh, monastics, uh, along with the government, was going to take out the concept of contentment of the Buddhist teachings. They didn't want to promote contentment because what would happen to consumerism? And Ajahn Buddhadasa was the leading voice that said, this is not what the Buddha taught and we're not going to have this here. And by dint of his sheer presence and, and, and will uh, and integrity, um, they abandoned that idea. But he was also um, called a communist. He was uh, very, very socially active and um, really stood, stood, walked his talk, so to speak. Um, many Westerners uh, became introduced to the Dharma through Ajahn Buddha Dasa. Some of my good friends, uh, Guy Armstrong and Carol Wilson, spent a year at Ajahn, with Ajahn Buddha Dasa. Uh, in robes, uh, Rodney Smith, another teacher who's up in Seattle, spent time with him. Um, and he was, um, he was very ecumenical. He was a, a scholar in comparative religion as well. So he had a very big view. And in fact, um, he would invite these, um, would invite Christians to come and have uh, dialogues. He'd have many conversations with leading scholars and clergy from, from different religions. This is what he says about religion. Um, because he, he uh, embraced a worldview which rejected any specific religious identification. And it's pretty amazing for the, one of the leading Thai masters, Buddhist masters. He said that in advanced perspectives, there is no religious identification whatsoever. Those who have penetrated to the highest understanding will feel that the thing called religion doesn't exist at all. There is no Buddhism. There is no Christianity there is no Islam. How can they be the same or in conflict when they don't even exist? What does that mean? They don't even exist. They're just concepts. They're just ways that the human mind has of understanding reality and very skillful and inspiring paradigms, but it's still just the human mind trying to describe that which cannot be named. And so he, was, he would go beyond the world of concepts. <clears throat> this might be a comfort to people who don't necessarily like the ist of anything, don't like to be called any kind of ist. The Buddha didn't teach Buddhism. He taught about waking up and the ism came afterwards. And yet, there's something very, it can be a skillful means to say, I am... I am a Buddhist, or I am a follower of the Buddha's way. It's not to put that down. It's just to see it on a relative level rather than the ultimate level. And I, I so respect Buddha Dasa for his spacious approach to, to practice and to, uh, to life. When you go to... It, one of his main centers is, uh, is called Swan Mok. I know some people. How many people? Anyone have been to Swan Mok? No, Kate has. He has. Yes. Um, actually, what's it like there? A lot of mosquitoes. Okay, that's what he remembered. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went down there, and I just—I was fortuitously there, and then I was also interested in Buddhism. I went to 
Yeah. And uh, I went up to the, the facility. There was someone there. I asked him, I'd like to meditate. Can I meditate here? And he said no. And <laughs> I wasn't sure if he understood me or what I was asking anyway, so I wandered in. And I got to a grove, an area where it looked like people meditated, and I sat down. And as soon as I did, the mosquitoes attacked me, and I, I couldn't meditate. <laughs> so he was right. He knew something. <laughs> Maybe he was just telling you what was so. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's Thank my you. story. Anything uh, here? Here, uh, Isabel. Uh, Kate. Um, the whole idea was to make it as realistic for Westerners as possible and um, Real close. and really make it like you were an, a monk or a nun and you were sleeping on uh, cement slabs with grass mats and wood pillows and getting up before the sun came out. And the mosquitoes were absolutely horrible, but... Um, it's the real deal. <laughs> the real deal, yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I went up to a, a Buddha Dasa center in Chiang Mai, and um, one of the things that struck me, there, were, there was art everywhere. Um, and uh, it wasn't like typical Buddhist art. It was uh, depictions, uh, different scenes that were very contemporarily drawn. Uh, that anybody could relate to uh, about about the Dharma. Um, when you practiced with him, it wasn't that he had any one particular method. This is how you should do it. If you wanted to, if you practiced with Mahasi Sayadaw and did mental noting technique, fine. If you did another kind of technique, that was okay too. He didn't, he didn't say, you should do one and not another. And actually, he said that all of those techniques are pointing to something beyond technique. And I want to share with you a, a lot of, uh, some of his, uh, his teachings that are, uh, that are in Jack's book. Uh, although he didn't propon- uh, wasn't a proponent of any one particular technique as the right one, he wrote one of the great classics on uh, mindfulness of breathing, Anapanasati. Um, and he, he's, he wrote many, many books. I was reading on, uh, on uh, the internet that there's a, one huge library in uh, one of the Thai, um, Thai libraries, one, one room in one of the Thai libraries that's just filled with his books. One of the most famous besides Anapanasati, is a book that I highly re- recommend called Heartwood of the Bodhi Tree, where he gets to the very essence of what the, the Buddha taught from a very high level of, of understanding. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit about his practice, which in this book is from a, an essay that that he wrote called, um, I can see it, Insight by the Nature Method. And he talks a lot in this uh, discourse about the place of non-concentration, of non-intensive practice. This is a good contrast to last time we were together when Sunlin was saying, this is the real one and you've got to really push, push beyond pain and those other ones are kind of wimpy and don't, uh, you know, don't, don't go for those. And I say this with great respect for, for that practice. It's just that there can be limiting views when you say my way is the right way. This is what Ajahn Buddha Dasa says, the intensity of concentration that comes about naturally is usually sufficient and appropriate for introspection and insight, whereas the concentration resulting from organized training is usually excessive, more than can be made use of. Furthermore, misguided satisfaction 
with that highly developed concentration may result. While the mind is fully concentrated, it is likely to experiencing to be experiencing such a satisfying kind of bliss and well-being that the meditator may become attached to it. This very easily can happen. Or imagine it to be the fruit of the path resulting from the attainment of nirvana, naturally occurring concentration which is sufficient and suitable for use in introspection is harmless, having none of the disadvantages inherent in concentration developed by means of intensive training. And then he talks about how, actually, in the Pali Canon, the uh, occurrence of people attaining liberation through intensive practice, you won't find it. It doesn't say, so-and-so sat for two weeks under uh, and did sitting and walking, and then he woke up. Although the Buddha is an exception. He sat under the tree, and something happened, and that was it. But what you do find is, over and over and over again, uh, instances of people hearing the Buddha give a discourse and waking up. So he makes the point... Mm -hmm. Clearly, no organized effort was involved when full enlightenment was attained, attained by the first five disciples of the Buddha upon hearing discourse on non-selfhood, or by the thousand hermits upon hearing the fire sermon. In these cases, keen penetrating insight came about quite naturally. These examples show that natural concentration is liable to develop of its own accord while one is attempting to understand clearly some question. So it's like you're, this is very different than the kind of retreats that, that I'm familiar with. And I want to just put a little caveat here and saying, and he makes the point, he will make the point. There is a value to intensive practice, absolutely. But not to think that it is the way or the only way, but that you can reflect on something and become so clear and focused, not because you're trying to figure it out, that doesn't work, but because there is a spaciousness of mind and a presence and a clarity that can open up the mind. It's highly unlikely that the mind will become free when you're trying hard to figure things out. So, you can just be open to a talk and who knows what will come. It happens naturally. Uh, as long as, as it is firmly established, it can be quite intense and stable. It happens naturally, automatically. And in just the same way as when the mind becomes concentrated the moment we set about doing arithmetic. Likewise, in firing a gun, when we take aim, the mind automatically becomes concentrated and steady. That, this is how naturally occurring concentration comes about. We normally overlook it completely because it doesn't appear the least bit magical, miraculous, or awe-inspiring. But through the power of just this naturally occurring concentration, most of us could actually attain liberation. We could attain the fruit of liberation, nirvana, full enlightenment, just by this means. Then, let's see, he says that deep concentration, this is kind of a follow-up to what I, a moment ago, is a major obstacle to practice. To practice introspection, one must first return to the shallower levels of concentration. So if you get highly developed, he says this is a good tool, but rather than staying there, then you kind of tone it down a bit. Just take it down a few notches so you're not so absorbed and there's enough stability and one-pointedness of mind that then you start seeing clearly the three characteristics of experience. Any one of them. And you can say, what is one of them? Anybody? 
Huh? Dukkha, okay, there is suffering in life. And another one? Anicca, impermanence. And the third? Anatta, not self. You sit there and you see everything coming and going, coming and going, that's impermanence. And then you see, or another facet is you see that holding on to changing experience is painful. And then you can also look at the lens that this mind-body process is changing experience and it's not as solid as we would think. He says, this kind of insight that comes from that lower level of concentration, of naturally occurring concentration, develops, even if it develops in small measure, it may convert a person into a saint of sorts at the lowest stage. And if it is not sufficient to do that, it will just make them a high-minded individual, an ordinary person of good qualities. Okay. But uh, even then, if that doesn't happen, we can acquire, while in that calm and concentrated state, it's bound to be beneficial in one way or another. Even if you're not a high-minded person, even moments of seeing things clearly start pointing you in the right direction. So, here's the essence, though, of this teaching. Insight into the true nature of things refers to those three characteristics, anicca, uh, uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-self, and seeing that nothing is worth getting, nothing is worth being, no object whatsoever should be grasped at and clung to as being a self or as belonging to a self, as being good or bad, attractive or repulsive, liking or disliking anything, even if it is only an idea or a memory, is clinging. To say that nothing is worth getting or being is the same as to say nothing is worth clinging to. This is one line that my teacher Joseph uh, would say over and over. Nothing is worth clinging to. Or in the, uh, I think it's the Diamond Sutra, deve Sutra, develop a mind that clings to naught. And Ajahn Buddha Dasa's, one of his main, uh, the phrases that I think of when I, when I hear his name is, uh, nothing to have, no one to be. If you can see the, the wisdom in that, you're free. Trying to be anything is a source of suffering. Being refers to holding on to the awareness of one's self-image, identifying with one's status as husband, wife, rich man, poor man, winner, loser, or human being, or even the awareness of being oneself. If we look deeply at it, even being oneself is no fun, is wearisome, because trying to be anything is a source of suffering. Because if you have this stance, oh, look at me, that self-referenting in, its, in, its, in itself is a separating out of reality. Now, in case you think, oh, I should just do away with the pronoun I or me, for convenience sake, it's useful to say, this is me and that's you. But to, again, play with it on different levels of reality so you don't take it to be the ultimate reality, but it's for convenience sake, the relative reality. Let's see. The burden of getting and being. Okay. 
The words getting and being are based on mental defilements, on craving, on maintaining the idea of worth getting, worth being, activating the mind to get and be in real earnest. This is bound to lead to depression, anxiety, distress, and upset, or at least to a heavy burden on the mind. But if we are mindful of this tendency, he says, it's not that you should say, stop getting, stop being. He says, just be mindful of it so you don't get caught in that trap. And in the moment that you're mindful, you're not compounding the problem. In fact, then you just see the human predicament because you're not taking it personally, oh, I'm such a beer, you know. I'm such a doer. I'm such a... Right there, again, you've gotten into the I'm such a... But if you say, oh, look at how the mind works without taking ownership or blaming yourself or somehow thinking, I should get it by now, then you're examining the nature of the way the mind gets confused. And if you can move from, as I've said this many times, from my mind, look at my mind, to, oh, look at the mind. Look at how the mind works and remove the my or change the my to simply the mind. There's freedom. No problem there. There's a new uh, book title I just saw. I think it's by some uh, Tibetan master that that I heard as a line from a Sri Lankan uh, master, no self, no problem. <laughs> hmm. So then he, he says, well, you might think this means um, if you're not a slave to your self-image or your possessions, if nothing is worth getting or nothing is worth being, then what does that lead to? Does it mean being a zombie? Does it mean just, oh well, life is just going to happen to me, who cares, you know, or there's somebody who's having a hard time, but, you know, I have nothing to, to, to do or to be, so that's their tough luck. He says, this is not it at all. Remember, he was a great social activist. I think he was one of the, yeah, he was one of the monks that um, when they started to cut down the teak in Thailand, they, they, it's been, it's so sad. It's been decimated like a fraction. I think it's maybe 10 or 15% of what was a century ago. That um, they would tie um, tie robes around the trees and ordain the trees so that the cutters wouldn't cut the trees. So he's not saying, well, oh, just kick back, nothing to do, nothing to be. He's saying, when you're not caught in that selfing or in this uh, heavy attachment of look at me, then your actions are coming from a very free and very powerfully affected, effective place because there's an emptiness that allows you to align with truth. And he said, he used the example of the Buddha. The Buddha you know, fed his body and did his activities, but what he did, he did from discriminating wisdom and loving kindness. It wasn't motivated by what's in it for me. And we all know you know, you just have to look at positive psychology these days. We all know that um, happiness, at least intellectually we know, happiness is not about what I can get, what's in it for me, but a deeper kind of happiness is giving to life, what I have to offer to life. That's a deeper, more fulfilling happiness. And that's coming from a very different place than check me out or, hey, give me give me mine. So, it's, it, it means that you're actually
just a little more and then we can do some reflections. Ah, yeah. This is great. So, untangling the tangle. There's a, a line, actually, it's in the... In, uh, I think it was from... The, from when the Buddha was enlightened, he said uh, that the task is to untangle the tangle. Is this still on? Can you hear me? To untangle the tangle, the, the knot, the, all of the, the twisted strands of confusion that have been developed for so long, to untangle all of that confusion and be clear and unknotted. And Buddha Dasa talks about this as well. He says, when we have really come to perceive clearly that nothing is worth getting or being, wholesome detachment with the world develops in proportion to the intensity of our insight. This is a sign that clinging has become less firm and is starting to give way. It is a sign that we have been slaves for so long that the idea of trying to escape has at last occurred to us. This disenchantment and disillusionment occurs when one becomes fed up with one's own stupidity in grasping and clinging to things. As soon as disenchantment has set in, this is the, the word nibida is used, which sometimes is talked of as utter revulsion or, dis, or disgust, but more accurately, it's, it's, the word is disenchantment with what usually mesmerizes and puts us under a spell. As soon as we see through that spell and disenchantment and disillusionment set in, occur, there is bound to come about a natural, automatic process of disentanglement as if a rope which one had been tightly bound were being untied. A rinsing out as when the dye that had been firmly fixed in a piece of cloth is washed out by soaking it in the appropriate substances. This process whereby clinging gives way to a breaking free from or dissolving out from the world or from the objects of that clinging was called by the Buddha emancipation. This stage is most important. Though not a final stage, it is a most important step toward complete liberation when one has broken free to this extent complete liberation from suffering is assured. Isn't that neat? Once you see through the game, really see, then you start to unravel all of the strands that have bound, kept us bound. And you keep on following that strand of truth and it will lead you to freedom. He says, you might think that, oh, well, that, that idea of enlightenment was for when people lived in the Buddhist time. He said, not so. It's available right here. And he says that the, one of the great supports is a purity, a coolness um, that comes when we are aligned with what brings happiness. He says, it is based on purity of heart, just like the Buddha says that when we, have, when we live from a place of integrity and wholeness, it brings about an ease and then we can find some, um, some mental happiness and joy. He talks actually a lot about spiritual joy. Just by making our own way of life, of daily living, so pure and honest, that there arise in succession spiritual joy, calm, insight into the true nature of things, disenchantment, withdrawal, escape, purification from defilements, and then the peace of nirvana, coolness. From this purity 
will find himself a spiritual joy in both work and leisure. And this very joy induces clarity and freshness, mental calm and stillness. Then he talks about nirvana or nibbana. He's the fellow who wrote the treatise Nibbana for Everyone. He says, if you think that nibbana is some, or nirvana is some kind of state that is really extraordinarily hard to attain, you're missing something. Nibbana, a state of complete coolness and relaxation, happens to us very often, but we miss it. He's, this is a great treatise. It's on the uh, internet. You can just Google Nibbana for everyone and you'll get it. He says, we have periods of rest or relaxation physically and mentally making us refreshed and alive and well. Why don't we know or feel thankful for this kind of Nibbana? We're, we miss it. That's the basic point. We're so, we're so looking for the next thing. But he says, if you can pay real attention to when the mind is completely free of wanting, when there is a deep relaxation where you don't need to add anything more or take anything away from the moment, that's a moment of freedom. And it's not that you have to wait ten lifetimes and do you know, 200 intensive retreats at Spirit Rock to get it. It's right here. It's right here. Nibbana for anyone and for everyone. Then the last thing I'll I'll mention, and then we'll do a little bit of reflection. He talks about the different Vipassana techniques. Organized systems of insight training were not taught by the Buddha, but were developed by later teachers. This kind of practice is suitable for people at a fairly undeveloped stage. That's you and me, okay? who still cannot perceive the unsatisfactoriness of worldly existence with their own eyes naturally. This doesn't mean, however, that the results obtained by these systems have any special qualities not obtainable by the natural method, because when we examine the scriptures closely, we find the natural method is the only one mentioned. Some people find it difficult to understand the natural method or believe that natural insight could be developed only by someone who had become so remarkably virtuous or had such a suitable disposition that for him to come to full understanding of things was just child's play. What was a person to do who lacked transcendent virtues and appropriate disposition? For such people, teachers laid down ordered systems of practice, concise courses which start from scratch and have to be followed through thoroughly and systematically. And he says, and that's fine, and we call his Vipassana, Um, And it is one of a number of ways. But the truly wise person, when a meditator, whether a meditator practices in intensive isolation or by the natural method, eventually he or she must come to an automatic integration of Vipassana and mindfulness in, in their daily life. Truly the wise person has no past or future They see that freedom lies in understanding that there is nothing to be lost, nothing to be gained, nothing to get, nothing to be. So with that in mind, let's just reflect for a few moments so we can maybe apply this to our own practice. I invite you to close your eyes. And... uh, Just reflect, how does clinging to getting things manifest in you? Clinging to getting, that means to having some experience or having some um, object. How does that manifest? What things, or when do you get caught in wanting And what would it be like if somehow there was no clinging to getting? 
Just imagine what that would be like. And then, how does clinging to being manifest in you? What is it that you cling to being? I am this. I want to be that. If I get to be this, then I'll be okay. Just see the different ways. It manifests in all of us, so not to take it personally. And what would it be like if there was an absence of clinging to being where you didn't have to be anything other than just what you are? Just imagine what that would be like. And now I just invite for just a a few minutes, if you feel like it, turn to somebody near you and you can pick either one, either clinging to being or clinging to getting. And uh, just uh, share what you might cling to. You don't have to get into the details, the sordid details or whatever. But imagine what it would be like if there wasn't clinging to either getting or being. And this can be something that perhaps you can practice this week. If there's something that comes to mind, you say, oh, I really want... Just put it on your radar. What would it be like to not get caught in that attachment? Okay, so just uh, we'll just take a few minutes in this to, to somebody and then we'll come back. So, If you need uh, somebody, you can raise your hand and um, here's somebody and here's a, here, there's, right over there, raise your hand up.
just another few moments and we'll end. So, get in touch with what it would be like to not cling. Could, now, I'm just curious. If you're, not that you're there, but if you could imagine what it would be like. I'm curious. Raise your hand. If you could imagine what it would be like to not cling to either getting or being. Okay. If you can, don't be shy about it. It's not like, you know, oh, well, who am I to imagine that? It, it's okay if you can imagine. It's good to imagine that because it just it allows that. It just opens up that possibility. It can be very inspiring. Wow, how cool that would be! You know? That's let yourself be inspired by your imagination. And, uh, we just have a few few moments left, but uh, anything that either comes up from his teaching or from that exercise um, you want to share? Yeah, all the way back there, Isabel, if you're sitting down. (laughs) Okay, hold it right next to your mouth, too. Um, What I I realized was that, um, uh, and I was telling my person that I was talking to, is that by clinging to that which I cling to, um, it keeps moving me forward to a future thing and it precludes my being in the present. So, you know, by allowing myself to let go of that, you know, I could enjoy things that I might otherwise, that I would miss because I'm so focused on the yearning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. And that both that allows you to enjoy being in the present if you're not clinging, but also the the corollary is when you come into the present, you've just eliminated the clinging. So that's, that's how mindfulness works. Oh, what's happening right now? And if you see this moment is complete, the clinging is not being reinforced and developed. Beautiful. Anything, anything else? What's right over here. Probably the last one of them. Um, I was just imagining what it would be like to not be clinging to being something. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Real close to you. Um, I was, for me, it, it felt like um, I could imagine a lot of self-acceptance or just acceptance and... Um, a feeling of not feeling inadequate because you're it. feeling okay with who you are. You're not wanting to be or clinging to becoming something you're not or obtaining something. Mm-hmm. Feel pretty good? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> the imagining of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in, the, in the dependent origination wheel, there is uh, from contact comes uh, craving, comes grasping, and then goes into becoming. Becoming is what he calls being. Becoming anything, becoming wanting to, to move forward and develop with the caveat that it's really healthy to develop all your 
gifts and talents. It's not to, it's not to abandon that. But if it's, well, then when I get developed, I'll be okay. That's the extra part. He's very much in favor of developing your full potential. But if you're doing it so that you will then be okay, you're setting yourself up for an for samsara, the wheel of samsara. There's no end to that becoming. So, just as you say, if you can simply allow yourself to just be, to just be right where you are, just who you are, that is freedom. And it doesn't take acquiring anything. It, it really means not doing not putting in that extra energy to be and just relax completely and have that nibbana for that's available for everyone. It rests on intention. Everything rests on intention. You just say, if you incline the mind to just be. Because otherwise, you will be caught in the habit of wanting and becoming, of greed, hatred, and delusion. So there's the intention not to make it happen. Well, if I try hard, then I'll just be. But to invite that openness of being and relaxing. Okay, so um, you might play around with it this this week. Oh, if there's something that came to your mind, see what it's like to to just relax the grip. Next week is going to be um, a hung shur. The following week, we will get to, I think, one of the, the coolest, or the heaviest, I should say, in the whole book. And it's the one woman in the book, Ajahn Neb, N-A-E-B. And she is heavy-duty stuff, you know. I, it, you'll, it'll, it blew my mind, you know, we'll see if it blows yours, her practice. <clears throat> Very simple very demanding um, and very freeing. So, that's in a couple of weeks. Let's close with a a loving kindness. Just feel your heart center. Breathe in. Breathe in all the benevolence and loving energy from around you. There's lots in this room. And let it fill you. And as you breathe out, just relax. Relax and let that energy radiate out from you. And then, simply allow yourself to relax and let life move through you. Allow yourself to be just as you are. Nothing extra that you have to add or take away. Here it is. And then from that place of being, goodness naturally radiates. Sending that to yourself and to others. May I open to all the happiness and goodness in my life. May I see clearly and know real freedom. May I feel the love that's inside and and share that well. And then sending that out to everyone here and all beings everywhere. As I want happiness, may all open up to the happiness in their lives. As I want peace, may all know real peace and freedom inside. May all beings share their love well. And may our coming together have a beneficial effect for everyone we know and for all beings everywhere. May all beings be happy.
Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.